Hi everyone, Nate Fink here with another Service Done Right video brought to you by Mitchell One. Today in the shop, 2015 Subaru Forester. Now I've installed a used engine in this Forester. We don't know the age, mileage, or service history, so we're gonna go ahead and replace the water pump as a precautionary measure. Let's dive in. Now as you can see, I've got Mitchell Pro Demand pulled up here, and I've already got our vehicle information loaded in. You can select the year, make, and model, I like to use the VIN number for an exact match every time. I'm going to go ahead and use the One Search Plus feature. Search for our water pump here. That's going to pull up all the information we need, nothing we don't. First thing I'm going to do is check and see if there's any technical service bulletins related to the service of this pump. Perhaps there's a known failure or some sort of information that may be relevant to us servicing a water pump on this vehicle that we'd like to know about. I have gone ahead and reviewed. And on this vehicle, there's no TSBs related to the water pump that we're concerned with. Now, with that being said, as many of you probably already practice, during water pump replacement, there's no better time to service a drive belt than along with the pump. There is a TSB for an updated drive belt on this engine to address a noise concern. Now, this is the kind of information you're going to want to know about when you're performing a service like this on this vehicle. Because if you go ahead and replace that drive belt with an aftermarket component that might cause an issue that could cause a comeback we want to avoid that so we'll go ahead and make sure that we follow the uh, the steps outlined in this TSB to install a part on the car that's not going to cause an issue not going to cause a comeback now as I had mentioned we're replacing the pump on this Forester just as a precautionary measure with that being said let's say you have a Forester in your bay that has a customer concern whether it be uh, some sort of a fluid leak or a smell while they're driving or an overheat condition, whatever the case may be. This card here, Top Repairs, as well as the Cause and Fixes, is going to show you typical mileage in which a lot of your fellow technicians are replacing engine water pumps. So if I have a vehicle in my bay that's around 100,000 to 140,000 miles and I have a coolant leak, maybe a water pump's a great place to start. If I have a lower mileage vehicle in my bay, 20 or 40,000 miles, Maybe a water pump's not a super common failure that I'd expect to see at that mileage. The other useful tool here is going to be these cause and fixes. This is going to give you lists of different symptoms and how commonly these symptoms are caused by this failure here. So if I have a vehicle that's leaking coolant, overheating, or there's some kind of a squealing noise, I might start looking in this direction of the engine water pump. Now we're not going to take this information as gospel. But oftentimes reviewing this info before you've even put the vehicle up in the air can give you a good diagnostic direction and save you time. Under the specification card here, there's going to be a lot of information that we're going to utilize later to verify our repair. Things like thermostat opening temperatures, things like operating temperatures, all that stuff's good information later after we've completed our repair to verify there's no other cooling system concerns that exist on our vehicle. Component locations is going to give us a really nice exploded view of the cooling system components on this engine. We're going to go ahead and zoom in here. There's our water pump. There's our gasket. We also see that this water pump and gasket bolts to a housing which also includes the thermostat and gasket. So as a best practice, when I go to sell this to the customer, I'd encourage them to just take care of everything in this area all at once, water pump and thermostat. That's going to alleviate any sort of future concerns, make sure that we don't have a comeback in the wintertime when the thermostat might be hanging open or causing some sort of a, of a cooling system concern. That's just a best practice. We'll go ahead and read through our remove and replace instructions familiarize ourselves with all the steps, we'll get our car up in the air, and we'll get started on the replacement. Now here we have our remove and replace instructions pulled up for the water pump, and you can see we've got some preliminary work, most of which I already have completed. Disconnect the ground cable from the battery, remove the V-belts, remove our radiator fans and fan motors, lift the vehicle, remove the undercovers. The next step is going to be removing the water pump pulley using a special tool. We'll do that now.
Now it appears the pump pulley's stuck on the hub, so we'll give it a few light taps with a hammer to loosen it up. Now obviously we've already drained our coolant, seeing as our radiator hoses have been removed. Our water pump pulley's been removed. Now the repair instructions tell us to remove the front exhaust pipe, probably to gain a little bit more access, but I think for today we're going to skip that step. We'll go ahead and remove the water pump from the upper oil pan. I'm going to utilize some emery cloth to clean up our gasket surface and get it ready for the new pump and gasket. Okay, as you can see, we've got our pump surface cleaned up nicely. We'll go ahead and install our new water pump and gasket and snug all the bolts down finger tight. Now you'll notice in our R&R &R instructions, Mitchell gives us our tightening torque specs for the water pump bolts, so we'll tighten those now. This is one of my favorite features about Mitchell's R&R. &R. It lists the tightening torque right here along in the instructions. You don't have to go searching through pages and pages of unrelated diagrams to find the torque specs that you need. Now for the last stump in our pump replacement, we'll go ahead and install the water pump pulley back on. And again, we've got the tightening torque for our pump bolts listed right here. Now I've gone ahead and cleaned up the hub of the pump pulley with a piece of emery cloth so it fits on there nicely without any excessive run out. Again, we'll hold the pulley with our special service tool and tighten these pulley bolts to the specified 14 newton meters. Now off camera, I've already replaced our thermostat and gasket, so that completes the water pump replacement. I'll go ahead and clean this area up, install our lower, lower radiator hoses, our fans back in, our V-belt, and we'll check back in about a coolant bleed procedure. Okay, as mentioned, We'll add a cooling system conditioner and coolant into the radiator filler, filler neck, which I've already taken care of. We'll top off the coolant reservoir, close the radiator cap, start the engine, and race it five to six times to 3,000 RPM. This is going to spike the RPM of the water pump impeller, force coolant through the system with the hope that it will push any air bubbles out into the top of the coolant system. We'll shut the engine down, top off the coolant level, and then repeat those steps. After this is complete, we'll start the engine, set the heater at the maximum hot position, and the blower speed setting to low. This is going to ensure that if our vehicle is equipped with any kind of a heater control valve or anything like that, it's open and allowing coolant flow into the heater core. We'll run the engine at 2000 RPM until the radiator fan starts and stops, which indicates to us that the engine is up to full operating temperature. We'll shut the engine off wait for the coolant temperature to lower below 86 degrees. This is going to bleed all the remaining air out of the system. We'll open the radiator cap, top off the coolant level, and then set the heater to the maximum hot position and the blower speed setting to low. Start the engine. We'll race it a couple times and we'll listen to see if there's a flowing sound heard coming from the heater core. To us, this will indicate if there's air trapped in the heater core or if we've got a completely bled system. 
While we were bringing our engine up to temperature, I put a scan tool in the vehicle to monitor engine coolant temperature sensor data and compare it to known good values listed in Mitchell's OE specifications tab. Here we get information like engine coolant temperature during normal operation and thermostat opening values. Using an infrared temperature gun, I watched the temperature of both the upper and lower radiator hoses to make sure the thermostat was opening at the correct time. The coolant bleed procedure is nearly complete. All that's left to do is wait for the coolant temperature and pressure in the system to drop until we can safely open the cap and top off the coolant level. I've done a preliminary leak check in bay and everything looks good, so we're almost ready for our final test drive. I'd like to thank Mitchell One for sponsoring today's video and I'd like to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.